Hello everyone, welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we review one vendor or uh, the solution. And for today, we have a very interesting solution. It's the hardest of the hardest uh, of the supply chain community. It's uh, Blue Yonder. Um, they used to be called JDA Software, which is one of the biggest enterprise system in the I SMB. remember that one, Sam. Yeah, yeah. So Andy, you are going to love this one a lot because obviously this is a very enterprise play and you are going to see the differences between where ERP sort of fits in and where these guys fits in. Now, the people who are not going to know the difference, sometimes it could be trickier for them, okay, when to use what? Um, so that's what we are going to be discussing the, the today. The price usually implies the difference. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, let, we'll dig into that. But before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. Uh, if you don't know me, Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP, commerce, supply chain, digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Andy for his intro. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Sam. It's always fun. Uh, my name is Andy Pratico. I've been involved in ERP software specifically for manufacturers. However, manufacturers also have supply chain issues, so there is some overlap there. Um, but uh, specifically for manufacturers for the last, if you can believe it, 42 years, I've worked all over North America. I've worked with hundreds of different manufacturers. When I lived in the US, I was actually a, a specialist for um, ERP systems for, for uh, government contractors, aerospace and defense contractors. So I, I met a lot of really cool companies, let me tell you. But um, anyways, throughout my travels, I wrote a book that helps companies evaluate it uncovered the truth about ERP systems before they buy. And uh, thank you so much for having me, Sam. Of course, Andy. And those uh, Air Force contractors are going to use a lot of this because obviously they have very of deep course. supply chain needs as well, depending upon which industry they are part of. Uh, you know, so it's always a very interesting play. If you're in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. Uh, we typically try to cover them during the show. If we run out of time, we make sure that you guys receive your answers. On that note, Andy, I am going to provide you the quick briefing overall, the sort of the evolution of the systems where they fit in um, and where this particular system fits in overall in the architecture. So one of the things, I mean, when we look at supply chain, supply chain is also a very niche area. It could be broad, but overall, when you look at blue yonder sort of uh, you know supply chain then we are looking at retail distribution um, you know automotive sort of retail where you are going to have like very parts retail is that what you mean yeah like counter sales yeah so it's uh, i mean you could have the automotive oems as well but wherever you are going to have the deep supply chain planning needs in right. my mind, in general, where With you are going to have... and stuff like that. Sorry, what was that, Andy? Uh, Distribution centers. Exactly, exactly. So the best way to think about this, Andy, is going to be any products that are probably going to be bombless. So generally, we talk about bomb. <laughs> <laughs> but wherever you are not going to have a bomb... So it's not at the airport, right? Exactly. It's not the airport. I mean, we all agree with that now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but obviously, the bomb less could be the services industries as well. We are not talking about services industries here. We are talking about product-centric industries that do not go through the MRP. Like wholesale distributors. 
uh yes wholesale distributors may have a little bit of distribution requirement planning but i mean there could be layers there for i, the I mean larger wholesalers exactly. right ones that have multiple distribution centers multiple warehouses and they have to uh yeah, exactly distribution is definitely a candidate to be honest okay that's where you're going to have really busy warehouses so the the way the supply chain uh systems work they are going to have three or four different components that are really heavy in that number one obviously is going to be your wms right number two tms number three is going to be snop planning system okay. absolutely but just, just, just stop for a minute let me i think this is a good question to ask for you to answer yeah. so the audience understands because you know you mentioned the very first acronym was wms warehouse management yep now Every ERP system that's worth its salt has something called inventory control. Yep. Uh, and and just like these little wee accounting systems will call themselves an ERP, yep. an inventory system will call itself a WMS system. So yep. what's the difference? Well, so again, depending upon the industry, and each industry is going to have very different needs. For example, let's say if you look at retail, in retail you are not going to have much of a role of an ERP. In general, in retail industry, the way they are going to use ERP is only going to be for financial reporting. For everything else, what they typically use is they are going to have a POS layer, they are going to have a OMS layer, and the other name is OMS for this as well. Okay, sometimes- o OMS stands for what? Order management system. Gotcha. Okay. okay. That is really designed for slightly more B2C centric scenarios because the kind of volume these industries are going to have, the kind of planning that they are going to do, ERP systems are not necessarily designed for that. So that's why they have to host these processes inside OMS centric systems. So OMS systems are also going to have multiple layers. Sometimes the OMS system combine, you know, pretty much everything the way Blue Yonder is, which is going to be your supply chain processes, uh, WMS, TMS, but sometimes OMS is going to be just for the order management. Now, in these scenarios, in retail, OMS actually controls the inventory, okay? So ERP is going to have just a teeny bit of inventory. It's not going to have a lot. The allocation, the inventory planning, everything sits inside OMS. So depending upon the industry, if you are going to have slightly more B2B play, B2B distribution manufacturing, that's where ERP becomes very handy because you have to know the cost. The reason why you cannot do these things inside ERP is because ERP cannot handle the workload of uh, these retail centric businesses, okay? You are going to have millions and millions of combinations, plus they are going to require very unique functionality that ERP systems are not designed for. So that's what we are going to review. So again, when you think of these systems, you are literally thinking of B2C verticals is where these guys really shine, which is going to be your retail. Uh, it's going to be B2C centric distribution where you are going to have a lot of volume, okay? Volume is the name of the game for the systems. Now, they have other layers such as merchandising planning. That's a very unique uh, process for retail industries merchandising and planning okay the way it works as let's say if you go for any of the retail stores they are going to be literally sourcing uh you know uh, 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 um, an apparel or dress or something like that if you are in the uh, sort of the apparel industry right uh, so their uh, processes are going to be very different the way they work sometimes if you are going to have manufacturing then you have to get into the manufacturing erp as well it becomes very 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 difficult when you are going to be a brick and mortar retailer plus an e-commerce shop, plus manufacturing, that's where you are going to have a lot of challenges, okay? But in general... Well, you know, but, I'll tell you, you know, you were mentioning about retail, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Forever 21 or any of these stores they have exactly. in the mall. Uh, that's interesting. You called it merchandising. What do you call it? Merchandising is the process. It's a team that they have. It's a function. So sure. merchandising, the way it works is they are literally trying to merchandise things, meaning they are number one sort of planning. And again, planning is a tricky term because they have a planning function as well, okay? And they go hand in hand. So one of the things that they do is they are making sure they have the right product 
at the right location for the customer and they need to source the right product as well. Okay, so they play much bigger role. I mean, it's very similar to not really engineering, I guess, because the kind of design, okay, in retail, because when you are going to be in apparel shop, you are going to have designers. These designers are designing and then they are sourcing from the vendor. So they have much thicker process, but it's very different in general, the way this business works. But you know, exactly. I'll tell you what's so different about that specific industry. Yeah. I mean, forecasting is a, is a, an art and a science as it is anyways, no matter what industry. But think about it. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, it's a comp- yeah. and and this year's spring is not good for next year's spring. Exactly. It's all new clothes again. Yeah. So they have to be so fast and so re- so proactive and reactive. Yeah. On fashions, not just historical demand, but yeah. forecasting of what they think they're going to need. Exactly. And the inventory is very different. The inventory planning is very different as well. The variables that you are going to have in inventory planning is going to be very different too. Um, Now, the other thing that I would like to mention is a lot of distributors and retailers, they are going to have a lot of 3PL processes. When you look at 3PL processes, you are looking at very, very, very different architecture. And that's where if you have 3PL as part of your business model, then you are most likely going to require a different WMS architecture. You cannot rely on your ERP WMS. So that's another trick that, uh, you know, companies need to think about if they have that particular aspect in their business model, then probably you're looking at something like this. Yeah. Most enterprise customers are going to use a a tool like this, at least for their WMS and TMS uh, processes. They might use SNOP integrated as part of this, but depending upon which industry they are in. In general, for retail, you are definitely going to use this if you are going to be any company that is going to be uh, over a billion dollar in revenue. So we have uh, a question. So we'll cover the question before we cover the slides. Um, Sure. uh, Andy. So uh, hey, uh, so we have Callan. Callan. uh, Peden. Follow him. It's uh, C A L L A N P E G E N is the last name. And the question that he is asking is: So what kind of features does these specific OMS offer? that defer to ERP solutions. Um, When you are looking at ERP, the kind of volume that the OMS systems can pull off, the ERP systems will struggle with that, okay? And we are looking at millions and millions of transactions. Uh, If you have to go through all those deep layers of costing, GL, you know, that's where uh, the depth of the transaction is going to be tricky to accommodate those millions and billions of transactions, right? Uh, and we'll see that in this particular case uh, where some of the customers really struggled to implement even these solutions, okay? <laughs> Which are really designed for that retail kind of workload, but they struggled for it and it was a massive disaster. So obviously ERP systems as of today cannot do that. And that's why you require a dedicated OMS layer not only for the inventory allocation, it's also going to be for micro fulfillment. It's going to be to serve all of the channels. So provide that centralized inventory view. Now you as the ERP consultant is, you are going to argue, you know what? That's what ERP does. But again, here we are talking about very different volume and very different perspective, uh, you know, for the OMS. So once we go through these slides, I think it's going to be slightly more clearer. It's just hard um, to understand, I guess, how OMS and ERP differ, but the biggest uh, advantage here is going to be in those thick layers of financials that ERP is going to contain, it can never pull off the same volume that OMS is going to do. And here, the the whole OMS layer is going to be significantly lean. It's actually serving it as more of the, uh, you know, omni-channel fulfillment layer, it's providing the OMS, WMS, and some of these warehouses are extremely fast. And even if you are going to use ERP, they are going to require a bolt-on WMS, okay? If you are simply going to use a WMS that comes with ERP, it hardly has any functionality. (laughs) So yeah, so WMS, TMS, you definitely need. But But they all say it's got WMS. (laughs) <laughs> they are always going to say that, Andy. You know this, right? <laughs> how marketing works. That's um, all marketing words, exactly. Yeah. 
So you know some other some other features that you find in WMS systems. You don't mind? I'll just make a couple. Of yeah, others please. Because, um, license plating. That's when you have uh, like a pallet. Uh, obviously, we're talking about tracking materials using a, a, a wand or a, a scanning device or a touch screen or something like that. But a license plating means you have a pallet of products, and maybe yep. there's it could be three or four different things. But the, the pallet, the license plate itself or the barcode on the pallet knows what's on the pallet. Exactly. And when you move the pallet, it's all one fell swoop, right? Exactly. Um, directed ahead, put away when you yeah. uh, when you're receiving, you want to be able to make, make sure the product is put away intelligently. Pick, pack and ship. We've all yeah. heard of that with that terminology before. Um, but you know, there, there are major differences between your standard inventory control and WMS, WMS, pardon me. Exactly. Could not agree more. In fact, I mean, see, if you look at some of the advanced WMS systems such as this, then you are going to find a lot more advanced functionality. Oh, I'm, I'm and it gets super, to it. super, super deep when you are looking at ASRS integration. Okay. You mm. are integrating with uh, warehouse floor robots the that integration is going to be oh, right wow. there as part of your wms system also right. it's going to have a lot more data layers that your erp is not going to contain for example optimization of your square footage inside the warehouse now that's a very different um, you know operational centric metric that you don't want to uh, clutter your erp with all of that information it's very warehouse centric information transportation uh, management same thing and, exactly. and optimizing the containers that they're shipping the products in. Exactly, exactly. And that, I mean, when you are looking at international shipments, it gets very, oh, very, yeah. very deep. Uh, that's why the WMS and TMS systems exist. Great points, Andy. Um, okay, so let's cover these slides here. So here, I mean, this is a very interesting and similar trend that we had seen in the case of Globia as well. So here, uh, Blue Yonder, it used to be called JDA software, Panasonic uh, ended up acquiring it, and that's a Japanese company as well. Company as well. I think all of these um, big OEMs are trying to grab the software company. So this was a very similar move uh, as that. So there are some very interesting movements for this particular software that they have experienced, but it all started, to be honest, with, uh, and I don't know, Andy, whether you remember the guy uh, you know, from Tama Bravo, is the private equity company they uh they have one Among of the bought plex uh plex yeah, is not with private Bravo, equity they bought plex yeah uh no plex is with rockwell automation right now oh, oh, oh. You, you are oh, talking about qad qad pardon me yes yes yes, yes. you're talking about qad yes and i am yes qad qad is a very supply chain focused system so thama bravo the way they, they sure. like to think and work they are very deep in supply chain and when they were sort of starting, they had like, what, $2 billion in their software assets. That's when they started doing this. They are the ones who started combining a lot of different systems from the WMS, OMS, TMS. So it was sort of the genesis from there. Okay, so it's a, now they have a lot of different systems in their portfolio. They A lot of them are very supply chain focused uh, as well as Jeep. Um, so here... Uh, and if you look at the number of customers, it's not going to be a lot. So they have like what, three thousand customers and retail. All big. Exactly, exactly. They are super heavy enterprise customers. Yeah. Uh, you know, retail manufacturing and logistics customers. Those are only three categories that they have identified. Uh, but even in the case of manufacturing, most of those manufacturers are going to use SAP. And SAP in uh, Blue Yonder, it's a marriage made in heaven. Okay, at one point of time, SAP never used to have like the EWM capabilities. Now they like to position their own product, but for the most part, JDM and Hatton, these were the products that were sold with SAP. Um, you know, SAP never wanted to focus sort of on, on, on WMS. But now they, they do have their own offerings, but still customers, when most enterprise customers are probably going to use Blue Yonder for their WMS, TMS, and SAP for their ERP. In general, that's how most enterprise customers are. Um, some more details here. What do we have? Um, okay, so one of the things that you might want to pay attention to is how 
they started. They started in the automotive space. Uh, a lot of these vendors, including SAP, did a lot of work in the automotive space because they drive a ton of needs overall from the supply chain perspective. Supply chain in general is very deep in the automotive space just because the way the whole supply chain is set up because, uh, you know, whatever demand OEMs are going to have, that drives the entire industry and it becomes very tricky to plan for the supply chain. That's why uh, automotive is always very heavy in supply chain in general. Um, so in 2006, they have a little acquisition here. They uh, acquired what? Uh, Manigistics Group Incorporation. This is the developer and provider of supply chain management solution. But here they are. They have not clarified in terms of which supply chain solution this was. We are going to review that. I think I have another slide on that. We are going to review where they got each of the capability, how they started, and how they sort of integrated. Uh, 2009, JD announced its intent to acquire I2 Technologies, and that was very big, uh, you know, company. By the way, there is a little correlation here. So there are two enterprise vendors in the market. One is Blue Yonder. The second is O9 Technology. O9 Technology is started by the founders of I2, I believe. Um, you know, so there are two major vendors, and they probably are coming from the similar team. Now, I2's um strength was always in that logistics space uh, you know that's my understanding but we'll confirm that on some of the slides that that we have so here they are talking about the acquisition was completed in jan 2010 in jan 2010 dillard's uh you know department stores one or two for yeah there, there was a big mass there for this judgment uh you know call against i2 and they struggled a lot and this is where i guess i mean uh, we have far more detail for this particular judgment hearing as well as case where, uh, you know, don't you, overall, hearing, don't you hate hearing stories like this? Eh? Yeah. But I mean, we need to pay attention to the details. Okay. Yeah. So even these guys struggled on the volume. I too claimed a lot of things in terms of how much volume they can pull off. But when you get into that enterprise workload, when you get into those merchandising and planning scenarios, okay, it becomes very, very, very difficult. And here, the only thing they were trying to plan is the store and the SKU combination. Can you believe this? And that itself was million and they struggled with that. Now, if you have the costing layers, if you have your GL layers, uh, you know, attached to that planning, good luck in that. Uh, I don't think we are going to be there uh, in next 20 years with the ERP capabilities. We cannot do that. We cannot pull off that kind of workload right now. Um, okay, so I don't have anything else here. Um, let's review the next slide. So here, 2020, JD announced it was renaming itself to Blue Yonder. And I don't know what were the drivers. Uh, one of them could be because Blue Yonder was slightly newer. Uh, it had that cloud-centric, uh, you know, look and feel. And JDA, obviously, there must be some negative connotations uh, around the product, especially uh, because of that judgment hearing. Go ahead. It, it was a known product. It was, you know, it was one of the AS400 types of systems back in the day. And I'm sure they wanted to differentiate themselves to being more modern. Exactly. But Blue Yonder in general was a very small company. And it's kind of shocking that, you know, you sort of acquire a very small company and you take their brand. Um, so it was a very interesting story. Oh, so they acquired the company and then they used their brand. Did they? Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. That's what is interesting about this story. Um, typically, the smaller brands would use the name of the bigger brand, But in this case, they used uh, yeah. the brand of the smaller company. Um, uh, they uh, score really well on Gartner. Uh, you know, they are probably a leader in the supply chain planning. So that's the SNOP part. Then warehouse management and transportation management. Uh, these three are going to be enterprise capabilities that they have. They are really strong with best of breed architecture. In general, when you are looking at those enterprise companies, one, two, three, four, five billion dollar, uh, billion with a B, uh, you know, that's where they are probably going to have very decoupled architecture. They are going to use multiple systems in their architecture. It, it says that they uh, they use Microsoft Azure. What would be your opinion comparing Azure to, say, Amazon or other hosting services out there? It's fairly even. I, Is it um, sixes? 
Yeah, it just the infrastructure. To be honest, it doesn't. Yeah, or the cost, or what they charge. Probably it's but big difference. Yeah, I mean both of them are very mainstream, so I don't think there is going to be much. Yeah. I mean, you are going to be deployed either on Azure or uh, AWS. So yeah, there is not much difference. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, they are doing a lot of work with Snowflake. Obviously, Snowflake is the hottest data warehouse company right now um, in the market. So obviously, they have a lot of collaboration there. In general, when you look at, into these planning scenarios, the forecasting scenarios, the database capabilities are going to be super heavy because you are running very, very complex product scenarios. Um, you know, And these are the solutions that are going to be utilizing the real machine learning AI. ERP does not see <clears throat> as much machine learning AI. The application is not as relevant, but when you get into these optimization scenario, planning scenarios, that's where your AI ML is super handy in general. Um, so here, I guess I have one comment, which is TMS plus WMS plus SNOP plus OMS is the combination here, um, you know, that you're looking at for the uh, retail and ERP is really GL. It's financial reporting. You don't really have much of a role uh, in retail industry for ERP, even today. Okay. So here we have the timeline uh, in terms of how they started um, and some of the names that we have not discussed so far, especially in the SNOP planning space, um, you are going to have solutions such as Anaplan. Uh, that's the gold standard for connected planning, but then you are going to be utilizing a separate WMS TMS. So depending upon how you want to build the architecture, SNOP could live in your uh, OMS um, TMS layer, but some companies might like to use a separate planning system. But when you get into that merchandising planning scenario, um, it might be difficult to accommodate everything inside those planning solutions. And that's why this integration sort of makes sense. And that's probably the reason why, uh, you know, Thama Bravo wanted to do that. Now, they might do the same thing for the other solutions that they have in their portfolio. Right now, they have Coupa, they have Anaplan, they have uh, what else do they have? They have QAD, they have Deltec uh, in their portfolio. They have Project 44. So they have a lot. They don't... Uh, they they own Deltec too? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, so here, uh, this one is, they started as JDA retail planning. So their roots were really into that retail planning segment, which is a very different planning than your any other MRP planning um, is going to be. This is, a, this is a completely different beast. It has nothing to do with ERP as such. Uh, now, 2006, they started doing a lot of demand management. In fact, if you look at the retail planning as well as demand management, that's where in a plan like solutions uh, are uh, today, to be honest, their capabilities are very similar to these two, which is going to be your supply planning plus demand planning plus the planning component. If you want to compare this, uh, Andy, Nexus is going to be the solution uh, that is going to be comparable here. Nexus does have the control tower capabilities, the WMS, TMS. Uh, you know, it has a little bit of SNOP co component. So the competitor for this is going to be Info Nexus, uh, especially in the Info portfolio. SAP has their product, mm -hmm. Oracle has their product. So that's, uh, yeah. So it's a very different beast in general. Um, the other topic that we did not touch so far is going to be, there is something called internal supply chain, external supply chain. Internal supply chain, when I say it is going to be in the four walls of your uh, you know, shop floor warehouse versus when you are planning for the external, meaning when you are going to have a good that is going to go through multiple hops, uh, multiple different legs, uh, you know, and then you are trying to ship to your customers or vendors or whatever you are trying to do. That external supply chain planning is extremely difficult. And th that's where these solutions sort of fit in. So you have the SNOP planning, plus you have the external supply chain planning in general, the retail organizations, they need to have the end-to-end -end visibility. And that's why they require that supply chain control tower. Supply chain control tower has nothing to do with ERP in general. People get confused. <laughs> they use ERP term vaguely, but when you look at the supply chain control tower functionality, that's a completely different solution. It's a completely different product. And that's where these guys come in. Uh, so here they have the TMS. Obviously, TMS is going to play a big role 
in that control tower functionality, in that external supply chain functionality, the network planning, that's a very different beast in general. Okay, then you have WMS as well. Inside WMS, you have to do a lot of things. Labor management, ERP systems are not really good for that. Okay, the space management, retail, real estate management, okay, those are very different scenarios. Now, if you look at the robotics, material planning, and material planning could be, could be very confusing as well, but we are looking at just in the four walls of warehouse, that planning needs to happen in a very rich WMS system, especially if you are going to have these automated picking system, ASRS systems, warehouse robots. Now, if they need to be integrated, they typically are integrated with the WMS system. The add-on that you are going to get with your ERP, that's very lean. It doesn't do much um, for WMS. Uh, 2018, they uh, got some of the AI and machine learning. So that's when they got Blue Yonder, I guess, because Blue Yonder was really big into AI and, and machine learning and company was looking for that, right? So that's why they, they had to change their name. Uh, they wanted to come across as more of the AI and machine learning solution. Um, then OMS is a very interesting offering as well. Uh, that's the order fulfillment. That's where the omni-channel uh, use cases are going to be handy. Sure, ERP systems can do that as well, but typically most ERP systems struggle with the B2C transactions. Those B2C transactions, the way the customer model is designed inside ERP systems, it's really designed for B2B scenarios. Uh -huh. In general, even the solutions, for example, NetSuite uh, has some B2C capabilities, but again, it becomes extremely bloated. So when you look at the B2C-centric order management, uh, that's where your OMS systems are going to be handy. So that's why they acquired this order management capability as well as part of this. And they have integrated with all of these four solutions. Um, now, some more commentary here. GDA software plans to acquire. So this is the commentary related to managed logistics for... Um, not for a lot of money. $200 million is not a lot, right? So well, that was 2006, though. Exactly, exactly. At that time, this particular company, so this is Thama Bravo, but they were not used to be called Thama Bravo. They were, they had a different name. So they had Thama Cressy Equity Partners. But if you look at the name of the founder, it's the same. Okay. Mm. Um, so an experienced enterprise software investor with approximately Two billion dollar in equity under management, which is very small. Uh, now they are almost like top five right now. Um, plans to invest fifty million dollar in JDA software. Um, yeah, some arrangement there. That's not relevant for this conversation. Um, combined company at that time they had uh, three hundred and ninety million dollar in revenue. Right now they have far bigger valuation as well as revenue, but at that time they were not as big in general. Uh, Okay, um, I think that's pretty much it. I think we have already spoken about all of these points. So let's move to the next one. So this is the judgment, uh, you know, that we were talking about. And here, let's pay attention to where they really failed. And this is a $250 million failure. Can you believe this, guys? Okay, this is probably the first time when software vendor was really sued for their limitations as well as misclaims. And after that, I think software vendors in general, they are careful in what they state, especially when you talk about things such as transactional capacity or transactional workload in terms of what you can do. In general, OEMs are very careful in uh, you know claiming their capabilities. So here the claim was for 1 million items. Can you believe this? The number of SKUs, only 1 million, and the product really struggled with planning. But this planning is very different from your MRP planning, the kind of planning that you are doing. Because here, you are going to have those 3D images. Uh, you know, because you are doing the assortment planning. So it's a very different workload than your ERP system where you are going to have a bunch of data elements. Okay, so it crashed at roughly 300K items, one of the biggest lawsuits in the history of enterprise software, uh, you know, uh, $200 million in damages. Uh, license cost was roughly, what, $8 million. Um, so, and they claim pretty much everything, all the losses that they had. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, too... At that time, had claimed that it, it could scale to roughly 15 to 18 million skew to store combination. That combination is where the trick is. Okay, if, when you look at this correlation, ERP is going to have 15,000 different co correlations. Here, they are not able to pull off just this. Can you believe this? Okay, and for ERP, it's just going to be skew and warehouse combination. 
<laughs> so it's that deep um and the, in terms of number of days uh, many gistics would take 42 days to run this workload can you believe this okay i too they claim that it could done it could be done in 4 5 hours but they were not able to do that and that's why there was a lawsuit um i have seen mrp workload for smaller companies running uh, up to what uh, 24 hours um some of them depending, depending on, on the complexity yeah exactly but it gets very deep when you are looking at enterprise uh, workload for MRP as well. Um, okay, I don't see anything else here that I wanted to cover. Um, okay, we don't have any other comments. Okay, we have a comment here. Let's cover that first. So here, Anders is saying, Andy on the palette barcode knows the contents of the palette in this arena. Is that via the barcode representing a single number being looked up in the database? Is it like you were talking about recently for Pharma, uh, where there were a big 2D barcode that literally held the barcodes for each of the individual items? Uh, so Anders, this is not just a barcode. It's the whole construction and deconstruction process that you have. Some ERP systems support that. So it's almost going to be, uh, it's almost like case of the case. Uh, and this process is actually built as part of your ERP system. So license plate is a piece of functionality that a lot of ERP systems can provide. But you know, if you are looking for- so, enterprise, Some can provide. Yeah. Not, if not a lot, but some can. If they are in distribution uh, centric verticals, then if they have to. Yeah, if they're warehouse management, likely they will. Yeah. 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 But I mean, if you're looking for enterprise grade license plate functionality, and typically if you're going to have ASN process, ASN process is where the license plate is going to be really handy because your customers are going to ask before you ship anything, you need to tell me what you are shipping, what are going to be the contents. Otherwise, I'm not going to accept. I'm going to return it from the dock, and then you are going to incur the expenses. Um, so typically, customers enforce the a ASN as well as the license plate process. And again, you need to have those capabilities to be able to pull this off. So it's a, it's a piece of functionality. Uh, okay, so now let's go to the next slide. So here they are saying by unifying. Uh, so this is the commentary coming uh, from Panasonic. And they wanted to acquire this because obviously their goal was to sell edge devices. The reason why they are selling edge devices is when you look at this external supply chain, okay, that's where you are going to have uh, the containers, uh, the boards, and that's where the, the real case of edge device is handy because if you are looking for end-to-end -end traceability, you need to have these devices on every single device so that it can emit the data that you can use to build the whole supply chain. And that's a very complex process, especially if you're looking at it from the revenue optimization perspective, from the uh, you know custom brokerage. Custom brokerage has very complex scenarios as well in terms of what you are going to pay. So you need to do a lot of competition to figure out, okay, how to ship. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, I don't have anything else, but I mean, that was the the primary motivation to really buy this. Um, here we have, this is the executive change, I guess. They got executive from Infor, Andy. Um, oh. so, the, so the recent one is the, he was the uh, president at Infor, I guess. Um, so that's a very interesting correlation there. Um, anything else did we want to cover here? Um, yeah, and they are talking about how many customers in four has. So obviously for them, it's a it's a big deal. Um, and he was sort of instrumental in when in four was sold to Coke, and that's what they might be trying for uh, this company as well. But um, that's a very interesting correlation. Now. Here, one of, this is one of the case study, I guess, on their site. Um, so this is about Microsoft using Blue Yonder to manage their supply chain. Okay, so this is going to be, and again, Microsoft is a humongous company. They have a lot of di different data centers, and they need end-to-end -end traceability, especially in data center business where you cannot afford to have even one second downtime. Uh, otherwise, you are probably going to be in trouble, right? So that's where the supply chain. Uh, 
predictability becomes very important. That's why it, Microsoft could have built this, but they utilized uh, Blue Yonder. That's how powerful this is. Um, <laughs> it displays uh, our entire global network and flags exceptions across our supply chain. So if there are going to be any delays, and we have seen how bad supply chain was during COVID, so we are looking at every single exception scenario across the supply chain, regardless of uh, who is carrying that container. Some of the intermediaries might be there in between, or uh, it could be your customers or vendors. You are tracking the entire supply chain, and you are making adjustments based on whatever signals you are getting from the field. Um, that's the kind of traceability that we are looking at here. OK. Uh, I don't have anything else that I wanted to cover. They are really using the control tower capabilities and control tower in general for supply chain. It's a massive, massive benefit if you are going to have that enterprise workload and external supply chain, which is going to be very busy. Now, this diagram sort of depicts a lot of different things. Some terms that you are going to see, they are not necessarily relevant to your um, ERP, but here you are looking at SNOP process, you are looking at the network strategy, and that's where you are sort of designing your routes, you are designing your lanes, you are designing your transportation, and that could have a lot of different cost elements there. So this planning is super critical for these organizations that are going to be heavy in transportation. Um, then what else do we have? Um, that's pretty much it. But again, this is very different from what you are going to see inside the ERP. The intent of this is not to manage ERP processes here. These are very different processes uh, from the supply chain perspective. Now, some of the use cases, uh, you know, where this is going to be a fit. So here we have with supply chain assets are redundant in the post m &A scenario. Again, when they say supply chain, it's they are not talking about internal supply chain. Primarily, this is very external supply chain in general, uh, you know, uh, as far as the scope of these products go. Uh, but this is also going to be very planning centric scenario. In planning, you need to forecast a lot. You need to figure out, okay, which assets are being utilized and which are not so that you can plan accordingly. Uh, how to assess impact of new financial regulations or tax exemption. Now, if you are going to do all of that, what if scenarios in ERP, good luck with that. They are not really designed for that. So that's where the, the planning is going to be really handy. Can the annual operating plan, by the way, the number of data sets that you're going to require for this planning are going to be humongous as well. Especially in the automotive sector, you are going to have a lot of different external data sets. Do not store them inside your ERP. You probably need either a data warehouse or a planning software in that you'll be managing that. And that's where this sort of fits in. Uh, now, if you are trying to optimize your AOP, ERP systems are very transactional in nature. The goal of ERP systems are not really for that use case. Here, we are running a lot of different computation, what if scenarios, and trying to figure out, OK, where you can make more money. That decision science needs to reside inside the planning system. Uh, where should the new plant be set up? <laughs> what capacity? Again, ERP system can provide you data, but you need to overlay that with other data sets and figure out those what if scenarios. That's where this is going to be handy. Which product should be made in each manufacturing facility? and or production line, there's a very different planning than the actual operational planning that you are going to do when you are actually running those workloads. Those two are very different in general. Uh, you know, cost trade-offs of outsourcing or foreign manufacturing, very planning-centric scenarios. Uh, optimize onshore versus offshore suppliers, very planning-centric scenarios. Um, What else do I have here that I wanted to cover? Um, yeah, so again, planning, planning, planning is where the system is going to be handy. Don't do planning inside your ERP. And when I talk about planning, meaning your external supply chain planning, supply chain planning, that's where these systems are really handy. ERP systems might be handy for MRP. That could be planning as well, but those are not necessarily the what-if scenarios. Now, uh, this particular screen might look slightly leaner, but these are different exceptions that you are looking for from the entire supply chain. These are going to be your shipments, the movements, the hops, whether you are shipping through uh, you know, air, ocean, whatever. 
you know, all of those exceptions are going to be at one place. Now you can make a decision based on that. And that decision needs to go inside your ERP in terms of how you want to cut your POs. But that decision and what if scenarios and the planning aspect need to reside inside your SNOP system. Now, this is the kind of planning that we are talking about. So you have a strategy builder, Andy. Now, this is a very different strategy builder compared to what you are going to see inside your ERP. Here, um, for the most part, the way you are able to build these decision trees, that's where uh, I guess it requires a lot more workload. So these are different what-if scenarios in combining a lot of different things in planning where to keep what level of inventory and you know uh, how to price these products uh, is needs to be done inside your SNOP planning. Um, so that's what they are. By the way, I mean, see, this particular analysis is they are simply trying to do just based on one Excel. If you have multiple data sources, it becomes very, very, very difficult. So this model we're looking at, this would be for a grocery store? Uh, this would be for a grocery store, uh, primarily retail. Yes. Yeah. Now you have, uh, you are overlaying that data with the space and then you have your planograms. Uh, you are trying to optimize the space. And again, you know, this is what is the retail planning. Retail planning is very different from your financial procurement planning that you are going to do inside your ERP. So this is a very different piece of software. It's not designed to do the ERP processes. You need both if you are a retail organization. But this is not relevant for manufacturing organization. This is only going to be for retail. Okay. Then it gets really, really deep in terms of predicting where to keep what is what it is trying to predict and where to order. And some of that planning may reside inside ERP as well. But for the most part, you are planning your demand and supply. And some of these signals will go to your ERP to um, as an input, uh, you know, but the retail planning needs to happen in this system. Again, don't try to do this inside your uh, ERP. So this is the assortment planning in terms of which assortment, which particular product combinations to keep where, in which aisle, in which store, in which warehouse. Now that's a very different planning than what ERP systems are capable of doing. Okay. Uh, the overall complex, and by the way, I mean, they have a lot of different variables, for example, risk, and they have the whole formula builder, the way you are going to see probably inside a spreadsheet, but obviously this is going to be slightly more structured, regulated the way you are going to plan here. So it gets very, 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 uh, you know, complicated. And you are looking at PSD guys, uh, if you don't have the software to be able to plan something like this. So it's very complicated in general. But for retailers, this is where the money is. Okay, these guys drive pretty much everything in retail organizations. So whatever they are going to say is what is going to happen inside retail organizations because they don't have other components that are going to be as heavy as this. That's why these software play a very important role for retailers. Now, this is the kind of you know planning that we are talking about in terms of the aisle, uh, the store inside the warehouse. So this is a very, very, very different planning uh, again, ERP systems are not designed for this. So you need to plan all of this here and then probably feed the signals to your ERP if you're running your procurement from there. Um, so that integration needs to happen. But overall, your retail SNOP planning needs to happen in this particular system. Now, some reviews. So here they are talking about, by the way, let me see, look at the persona of the person who has reviewed this. So this particular person is the store designer. And typically, these systems are going to be used, especially if you're talking about SNOP. Uh, it's going to be your merchandising team. It's going to be your designers. Uh, it's going to be your retail planners who are going to be using the planning system. That's their bread and butter. If you look at uh, warehouse operations, then you are going to have warehouse managers. If you look at the TMS processes, those are going to be your logistics managers who are going to be using. So <clears throat> again, the persona are not really the ERP ones, but again, the ERP organization in general is going to be very lean uh, inside retail organizations. So here uh, he is talking about, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is a, go ahead, Andy. Oh, I'm good. Okay. 
So here, this is a design shop and design, even though they are saying design, most likely it's going to be physical product design, uh, something like uh, furniture or something like that. We'll see. Maybe we have some colors here. Go ahead, Andy. I was going to say engineering. Well, so engineering is going to be slightly different, okay? Uh, if you have the engineering component in your business model, then probably the software is not going to be good fit for you, okay? Mm. Uh, unless you are selling a very commoditized product, then it might be okay. Uh, but if you are going through that engineer to order process, then you are probably going to require an ERP. This is really for very commoditized B2C products. Um, JDA overall is beneficial to have within any retail company, and he or she has particularly used this term retail company. Uh, retail is where the trick is. The one source to house all details and information that can easily be generated through reports. Uh, various amounts of detail within a planogram or floor plan. That's where the money is for retailers, and that's why this particular system is their bread and butter. Okay, they might live without an ERP, but they cannot live without this one. Uh, Easy to navigate from store to store, product to product. Uh, I have learned that opening up multiple four, uh, floor plans can cause the program to slow. I do wish I was able to drag fixture, obstructions, planograms. All of these objects are modeled inside software. And based on that, you are planning real estate. That's a very different planning than your financial and operational planning that happens inside your ERP. So use for the right job. Um, okay. Uh, this one, some more comments here. This one is electrical and electronics manufacturing. In general, these guys are going to have slightly leaner use case for the software. They are going to keep a lot more processes of inside their ERP just because they are doing manufacturing. But retail-centric processes, as well as WMS, GMS, are most likely going to reside in this one. So here they are saying this software is wonderful to use for store creations, planogram, layouts, visual, merchandising, placements for brick and mortar locations. Brick and mortar is where the trick is. So in this particular case, these guys must be, uh, you know, they must have retail locations for the electronics category, even though they are manufacturing themselves. So for manufacturing, they'll use ERP. For retail operations, they'll use this. Then we have Michael. Michael is IT solutions manager. Uh, this is automotive supplier. So this becomes very interesting as well, because they are going to have a little bit of distribution and manufacturing component as well. So your architecture is going to be tricky. So here they are talking about flexible in configuration, fast to implement. Uh, in case business requirements are clearly defined, covering mostly all needs of automotive supplier industries in case of build to order processes and sequencing. Now, this comment is slightly misleading. Uh, in my mind, uh, some of the things such as sequencing can reside in both of the system. They have different purpose. They have different role. So make sure you understand this se sequencing you are talking about. Uh, the person is also saying that it can cover anything related to a automotive supplier. Uh, that's not right. Uh, you know, so you need to um, accommodate your retail centric, transportation centric processes. In this one, ERP and manufacturing distribution centric processes need to go inside the ERP system. So make sure you guys pay attention to that. Uh, here, this is a consumer goods company, uh, 10,000 employees. So obviously, these are very enterprise centric clients. But versatile uh, software for POG building and analysis. This person is also talking about planograms. Okay, if you look at the commentary, one of the things that you are going to notice is planogram. Planogram is where the money is for retailers, and they absolutely love the software. I use G JDA for building planograms and analyzing their performance, enjoyed how flexible it was, and the ability to make on my own rules, and rules meaning strategies, and those strategies are extremely powerful. They make a lot of money just because of that. Um, Andy, any comments? We have four minutes right now. More reviews or more reviews? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, another, another review. Okay. So 2014 Global WMS Evaluation for High Tech Manufacturer. So this manufacturer is most likely going to use ERP, but they might use WMS from JDA or Blue Yonder. So I think that's what they did in this particular case. Uh, this uh, company is also 
logistics and supply chain company, which means they are going to have 3PL component. They are keeping inventory for somebody else. Okay, that's a very different process in general. That's where, uh, you know, JDA is going to be really handy. Core WMS has very strong capabilities for high-tech industry used by third-party logistics. So if you are going to be third-party logistics, ERP WMS is probably not going to be handy for you. You are looking at something like this. The product is highly configurable and scalable for large complex organizations. A lot of third-party logistics providers always use and are comfortable with Red Prairie WMS. And I have to agree with that. Uh, they were not as good at partial shipping mar module was very new and unproven in marketplace. That's a very shocking comment because, uh, you know, this solution is really designed for retail, but they didn't do as well in, in parcel shop, uh, uh, shipping. So maybe they combined the capabilities of two different WMS system. This particular review is coming from 2014. Um, at that time, they would not be integrated, but now their offering is going to be far deeper. So maybe they have these capabilities. Um, so make sure you guys review that trading partner management and distributed order management. Distributed order management is another term that is used in the context of OMS. Okay, when you are going to be splitting your orders to multiple suppliers to multiple facilities, that particular functionality needs to reside inside your OMS system just because that is actually holding your source of truth for inventory, especially in retail organizations. Okay, I'm not talking about manufacturing distribution, just retail. For that, so distributed order management becomes very critical because that needs to be distributed even with WMS as well as CMS. So it's a very interesting piece of functionality. Uh, make sure you guys pay attention to that. Uh, this one is also a logistics company here, uh, 2022. So a lot of CPLs actually use this and they have very different processes compared to uh, your mainstream providers. User interface has too much info at a given time. It can be broken down further to reduce clutter. Obviously, this is a very complex system. So if you are not enterprise grade, then you know don't use it. Uh, or learn how to use it, but this is designed to be complex. Uh, end user needs to have more customizable options to design the page. Again, these are very touchy-feely reviews. Changes made can be updated quicker. No, not very meaningful. Andy, more review, comment? Uh, one minute right now. No. Um, hey, I think I think this word said this one. You have underline on the right says it all. The best and most configurable routing software available for the grocery industry. Exactly, and grocery is a very tricky industry in general. Yeah. Um, okay, you don't want to use ERP there. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's where these guys really shine. Um, so yeah, uh, we can take some comments, closing comments, and uh, then finally we can wrap up. Uh, it, you know, for more, obviously you, you never can get into a ton of detail when we're looking at uh, these overviews, but from what I can see, this is a very powerful system in the right industry, in the right type of company, it would be fantastic. Exactly, and we'll probably bring back some of these reviews in deeper detail, uh, looking at their screens, uh, different piece of functionality, I guess, in the future. Uh, but this was the first one that we did for this particular uh, solution, Andy. Uh, we need to set the context, and then we'll probably go deeper. Awesome. So if you don't have anything else, so that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back. On that note, thanks for tuning in. Um, have a great day, everybody. Have a great day.